Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, welcome to the classroom panel. I'm very pleased uh, to have here on my left side two uh, speakers coming from very far away, also from this case, Indonesia and Malaysia, Malaysia. but India nationality. So, as you know, we have uh, Dr. Ismail and then uh, Dr. Misra. Uh, it's a uh, pity that this afternoon Dr. Dosh couldn't join us due to uh, sickness. So he obviously is a uh, great thankful to the organizers and uh, to the attendees, uh, but unfortunately he couldn't make it today. Nevertheless, uh, we have a little bit more time for our two speakers um, since we want to try to make it on time. Uh, maybe what we're going to do is about 15, max 18 minutes talk, and then we have time for the Q&A, which is always uh, very interesting so far. Um, and without too many uh, introductions, I'm going to give you the floor, uh, Dr. Zain. Uh, yes. The floor is yours. Oh, we have a visit in Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ms. Nuri, Ningring, Paolo. Thank you for the opportunity. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished professors, scholars, uh, students, and all uh, participants. Uh, first of all, please allow me to extend my deep gratitude and uh, appreciation to the conference organizers, in special Professor Sebastian Resik, that have uh, invited me to come here to join this very um, uh, very reputable uh, forum for talking about uh, the important issue today that we are facing in, in Asia. Well, uh, unlike uh, the previous uh, presentation, my topic uh, for this occasion, maybe perhaps I need to stand up. I choose a specific uh, topic for the meeting that of uh, that is over by the organizer. Um, this is not related to uh, high political issue, but I think it's uh, something that I think I believe uh, more uh, concrete in terms of the uh, issue that affect the, poli uh, the the quality of life of our people in Southeast Asia. So. Uh, I'm happy that in the previous presentations, uh, uh, some presenters uh, mentioned about uh, the, the possibility of uh, the city's role in uh, accelerating or, or in taking a part in the accelerating collectivity among uh, these two regions, and EU and, and Asia. So this is uh, the title that I put for my presentation, uh, how we uh, strengthen the strategy for Asian secondary cities and how to uh, strengthen the US and cities policy for connecting Southeast Asia. Of course, there are some reasons for that, but uh, for the beginning, I think I should uh, uh, let you know about the objective of this presentation. First, is of course, to emphasize that the organization is one of the ASEAN most pressing problems today and in the future that directly impact to the quality of its people. So it needs, it needs serious, quick and concrete but systematic response. Second one is to emphasize the importance of uh, secondary cities in ASEAN member countries to be the important player to address the organization related development and challenges in ASEAN today which has been transnational in character and um, multi-levels. And the third one is to encourage uh, EU for prioritizing our strengthening EU as a strategic cities policy in order to empower Asian cities leaders and connecting Southeast Asia to their roles in Asian cities conference. Uh, talking about connecting Southeast Asia is impossible without putting ASEAN as a central Of course, there are some reasons for that. First, uh, it has been acknowledged that ASEAN has successfully uh, maintained peace and stability in the region for more than 50 years. It has established the principle and institutional mechanism that can 
even open conflict among its members and the interference of external partners to get conflict with them. The second reason is uh, ASEAN has continuously developed institutional framework that provide its member countries a foundation to continuously conduct their developmental process individually and collectively, despite of their still some weaknesses or limitations. And the third one, ASEAN has consistently developed various efforts to meet the increasingly socio-economic developmental needs of its members, which is in line with the challenges of global dynamics. So ASEAN, in fact, has its own regional economic architecture building. So this is the map of ASEAN, and if we can see, uh, ASEAN has a big size in terms of uh, territorial size. Uh, totally, the area is more than four uh, million, uh, four million kilometers, and then the population reach about 625 million, according to the data of 2013. And if you talk ASEAN as a as a uh, entity, as an economy entity, collectively, and we can see that ASEAN has uh, three potentials in the global economy. If you, if you can see, ASEAN is much bigger than India, but still uh, uh, lower than uh, Japan, China, EU, and USA. But indeed, it belongs to top five. Uh, economic uh, power in the global economy. So I think uh, my topic uh, I choose because uh, I believe what uh, World Council, World Business Council on Sustainable Development have uh, suggested that there are many global sustainability mega forces and all related to the environmental degradations and energy issues and one of them is the globalization issue. So all these uh, challenges are, are very complex and indeed needs uh, more uh, greater vision and efforts to handle, to deal with. And of course I also want to uh, emphasize the importance of uh, environmental risk because according to World Economic Forum in 2017, uh, among the five top uh, challenges in the world is uh, the first one is environmental risk, especially something related to climate change issue. So of course there are uh, some other global challenges which also uh, have caused uh, serious problems towards uh, humanity. And here I think uh, the issue of uh, ASEAN that we have to face in more details and more systematic ways because uh, there are another challenges uh, that ASEAN will be facing in the future, according to uh, experts from World Economic Forum, Professor Mahmoud. There are seven key challenges for the future of ASEAN. Then, if you see uh, among these seven key challenges, uh, the six the six uh, challenges are related to the uh, sorry the role of uh, not only states that I, as I assume that there should be another key players, not only nation states, because it will affect uh, the multi-level uh, interrelations. Also, I think uh, we have to uh, take into account what the Global Targets 2030 have uh, outlined and all the ASEAN member countries, I think, have pushed their efforts to meet their, the targets of this uh, global agenda. And if you see in the in the 11th uh, target, uh, there is the issue of sustainability cities and uh, communities. And the rest, uh, the others, uh, I think uh, also many that are related to environmental problems and energy uh, efficiency. So uh, if you talk about the cities uh, in this uh, issue of connectivity, why? There are some reasons that I think uh, the cities have uh, played an important role. The uh, first one is uh, if you talk about interests and strategies for connecting Southeast Asia, I think cities is the actor who have centrality to the people as well as to the actual 
problems resulted from the global and regional dynamics challenges. <coughs> and also what should be underlined here is for such a long time since the establishment uh, in 1967, ASEAN has heavily relied on the role of national governments and their national allies as the main actor to drive regional integration. So uh, the vision of ASEAN uh, community should therefore open the bigger room <coughs> for other key actors that have legitimacy to accelerate the process and targets of ASEAN developmental uh, process at uh, both local, national, and regional towards the SDGs global targets of 2030 and other strategic uh, targets. The third uh, argument, I think, is cities has been identified as centrality, capacity, and capability to be a significant international power that can address <coughs> the global real problems for humanity and sustainability. Michael Okuto and Simon Curtis, uh, in their books about the power of cities in international relations, has uh, enforced the importance of cities to be taken into account as the strategic national, international player in the future. So, there are still another reasons. First, talking about cities, actually what I mean is not talking about the capital cities of ASEAN. What I more suggest uh, is uh, secondary cities. Secondary cities uh, should be considered as the key actors for pursuing the vision of ASEAN connectivity because in their hands, the agenda of sustainable green infrastructure and sustainable urbanization strategy in ASEAN will be well implemented if, of course, they have the same vision with their national allies and they have some uh, political uh, coordination. These two initiatives actually, at its heart, are designed to meet the speed of urbanization process in ASEAN with its dynamic problems and fundamental challenges. Another point of argument is about ASEAN Cities Network. This is actually the initiative of Singapore during its chairmanship of ASEAN in 2018. It is initiated, uh, initiated, initiated by Singapore uh, to, you know, to, um, in order also to accelerate the process of connectivity, whether it's uh, physical infrastructure uh, connectivity, institutional connectivity, and also people-to-people -people connectivity. I would say that it's a good step, but still has some limitations. Of course, there are empirical studies uh, need to do uh, to see the future of this network. But what is uh, important to be highlighted here is, uh, it seems that this initiative rely on technological technology matter and say don't by the single and the great interest of the USA. And showing the maps of the world cities. If you see the map, then you can find that the number of cities is much uh, bigger than uh, the total number of the nation states. So you can imagine what happens if uh, the cities cannot be taken into account in our uh, conversations. And this is uh, the initiative of our ASEAN Smart Cities Network. You can imagine how the 26 C pilot smart cities has been connected so far by uh, the initiative of Singapore. Uh, and you can imagine also uh, how if the railway, uh, railway uh, infrastructure has been built to connect all these cities in, in the ASEAN region. Okay. This is some reason why cities is important in terms of the global uh, or world politics and the global uh, economic dynamics. Cities uh, now is the home for more than half of the world's population. Also, it plays as a center for economic growth, industrialization, and civilization. And the important thing, it serves as the hub for national production and consumption, so various social and economic activities that create wealth, also the place for the interaction for various aspects of locality and globalization that change social and economic conditions. Uh, this is the, the definition of secondary cities, not the capital city, but serve various strategic urban functions 
that result in significant social and economic aspects because they have strategic locations and assets. Uh, There are three types of growth that will affect the growing of cities and its uh, complexities. And the world has uh, launched declaration of the 2030 for sustainable development in which the local authorities and communities put in the central to uh, play uh, the globe in the global dynamics for enhancing the quality of life of the people in this planet. So, there are some reasons why urbanization strategy is uh, important. Uh, ASEAN has a blueprint, blueprint for uh, accelerating uh, urbanization strategy. And some reasons of it, you can see in these slides, uh, it deals with the phenomena of uh, uh, the urbanization in the world, and ASEAN itself is also part of this global phenomena. Uh, urbanization increased demands on public infrastructures. That's why, due to global environmental related challenges, as uh, we see in the, uh, in the previous slides, green infrastructure must be the policy choice for bringing prosperity as well as competitiveness. Uh, this is the urban urbanization that will uh, pose uh, uh, the governments at any levels how to deal best with these uh, issues. They can play as the economic growth, but in the same time, in another side, they pose some challenges which is very uh, complex and uh, difficult to solve the problems and solve it from. Um, These are some characters of ASEAN urbanization challenges, which is uh, need serious uh, strategy how to deal with. And I assume uh, not only a uh, national government that can work that can work alone to solve all the related problems. And now, I come to the part in which uh, I suggest that EU ASEAN City Strategic Partnership should uh, be developed. I don't think I have a specific uh, blueprint or docu official document talking about this, but I know that uh, EU has developed uh, EU ASEAN uh, EU-China Cities Partnership, which is a very systematic and very comprehensive uh, 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 design. So I, I'm asking why you do not the same thing with the ASEAN. Because I believe that uh, you have strong institutions, you have uh, strong values and responsibility to, uh, acceler to support ASEAN for accelerating uh, their uh, their achievement. All right. Thank you. I will. Uh, I will uh, a bit uh, switch. And then I think uh, what I also want to suggest that uh, the design should be uh, a system of regional networks. So what I see is uh, what you has been doing so far is very ad hoc, very uh, project oriented, and I don't think. I don't see uh, something that uh, more visionary in terms of building their ties with, uh, uh, with ASEAN cities uh, in giving their uh, financial support uh, and institutional support. Then I think uh, EU has, uh, due to its experience and technology advancement, EU has capacity, capability, and legitimacy to continuously support ASEAN to empowering ASEAN cities leaders so that, so that they can have global green vision to action progressively and bring about transformative changes of their people. And there are also some other arguments uh, why EU uh, has its relevance to do this kind of uh, proposal. Uh, okay, um, but I want to uh, underline that city's leadership and governance is the key factor to, to successfully meet the basic requirements for Global Competitiveness Index, especially for fundamental aspects of institutions, infrastructure, macroeconomic development, as well as health and primary education. I would like to quote this <laughs> statement, uh, which is, uh, I like uh, so far, because uh, Colin Crooks, as the head of European Union delegation to Indonesia, uh, have stated this. 
which strains the local government with the ability to conduct and clear public services, provide infrastructures, and create a sense of belonging and togetherness in a community. With all this, the local government can reach out to grassroots societies, encourage direct interactions between societies in different countries, and play a visual and regular policy. And this is also another uh, uh, important statement from OECD on Chabal Kumitu that stated that cities should take a leading role. Coherence between national and local policies is vital. So initiatives should be mutually re reinforcing. The better national framework they share it will be for cities to address their specific challenges in which they enhance rather than undermine their competitiveness. So as a conclusion, I think uh, talking about connecting Southeast Asia, uh, there are three points uh, I will uh, highlight. First, ASEAN connectivity will be anchored on the people's perception of its relevance and impact on the economic well-being of its peoples, whether ASEAN actually matters. Second, the pursuit of ASEAN connectivity 2025 and the 2030 SDGs as well as the implementation of ASEAN sustainable green infrastructure and sustainable urbanization cannot be well implemented possible without fully engaging the city's leaders and the practices of good governance in which EU has a uh, uh, has, uh, good commitment in this issue. And then EU ASEAN city strategy partnership should be designed the network system and sustainability system. And this is uh, what Robert Dell, Mayor of Melbourne, said about <coughs> the importance of cities today, that we should not be neglected. Nations of cities, actually. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Snyder. Thank you very much for bringing us a different view and an ancient view. It's very good. Uh, we give the floor now to Dr. Lisa. We a little bit of time, so we are good on time, don't worry. Please, mm. whenever you want, the floor is there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I uh, would like to thank Professor Sebastian Bosick for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I think the stage for uh, <coughs> So this is what we Sorry about this. Well, I think the stage for this two-day conference has already been set. Uh, Professor Gates and Professor Persick both spoke beautifully about uh, the impact of globalization and how uh, we are seeing the rising centrality of connectivity within countries and regions across Asia and Europe and also the role of major stakeholders, that is major powers playing a role in that. Uh, there I wish to add just one point. Uh, before I begin focusing on Southeast Asia. And my point is that this quest for connectivity is not new. If you do not take this into consideration, we actually miss the point that the Chinese are trying to make. It is not just about connectivity when you talk about Belt and Road. It is not just about connectivity when you look at Silk Road. The idea is accepted, embraced, because it also, in a way, talks about going back to history, where the Eurasian Asian countries were at the, uh, at the center stage. So, so this actually is very important. Setting this agenda is very important. Now, over the past centuries, we have seen that the idea of connectivity is just about hard connectivity, physical connectivity, rail, roads, and uh, maritime linkages. What has happened, what has changed over the past three decades is uh, that this connectivity has gone into the realm of free trade negotiations, lowering your trade barriers, 
looking at people-to-people -people connectivity, direct uh, linkages, direct flights. If you look at the documents, ASEAN and its dialogue partners, their documents, they talk a lot about people-to-people -people contacts and starting direct flights. And then there is digital connectivity. So connectivity as a whole is different. This phase is different from what it was in the 60s and 70s and 18th and 15th century and thousands of years back. The other thing about connectivity is that it attempts to plug the gaps that persist even after the, the latest wave of globalization. And that's one idea which China has picked up beautifully and is projecting, uh, is harping on it quite a lot. When, when you look at the agenda that was set at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, that was the idea. I'll come to that later. If you look at the Silk Road Fund, or even the support to the Eurasian Economic Union, you go to Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the talk is of Eurasian century, or Asia for Asians, which is more political than, uh, than any, anything else. But the idea really is that China, as the leading power, China led Eurasian century. Right? So if we just look at this current phase of connectivity and China's Belt and Road and nothing else, then we just look at China dominated world. Of course, there are differences between what China says and what it does. The, the terms and conditions that it has come up with are totally different, but uh, we leave that for a while. Now, when we talk about the latest wave, latest phase of globalization, there are gaps. What has happened over a period of time that within countries there are regional disparities. Uh, geography scholars would uh, explain that better. There are regional disparities within countries. There are regional disparities in a, in a region like ASEAN. And there are also disparities, uh, the gaps between the developing and the developed world. So if you are sitting in Kashin province of Myanmar, a connectivity to you means physical connectivity, and that's it. And half of the Kachin people are not interested in connectivity. They don't know what air aeroplanes are about and what you, would you do with that. Why it is important to go to New York for, for, for a Kachin, Kachin rebel who is fighting the uh, Takhodaw, the Myanmar Defense Forces. So you have to look at connectivity in different, there are different uh, meanings of connectivity, I would say. Uh, Professor Basak uh, mentioned uh, very briefly a very another very interesting point that Asia is not just about China. Uh, well, interestingly, we discussed when we talked about connectivity in the first session, we spoke mostly on Belt and Road and China. We sort of overlooked the Partnership for Quality Investment, which is the Japanese initiative. Uh, we overlooked a number of other initiatives. Uh, and it is in that context that I try to make this presentation on what connectivity, connectivity means for the Southeast Asian region and why it is slightly different from how we look at it from this part of the world. Now, what I propose to do in the next 15 to 20 minutes is focus on these areas. Uh, I'm sorry, there are too many actually, and this is meant for, a, uh, for the paper. Uh, but as you can see uh, here, the importance of connectivity in Southeast Asia, the principal drivers uh, bringing regional, interregional, and intra-regional connectivity uh, to the next level, who are the main uh, sources of our support. Then you have the ASEAN master plan on connectivity. That's ASEAN's own idea. You have the sub-regional groupings too. Um, you have uh, the Greater Mekong sub-region. You have East Asia growth area. Then you have Sejori, which involves Singapore, Indonesia, and uh, uh, Malaysia, then there are governmental and non-governmental organizations, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, ADB and the World Bank, interregional cooperation includes ASEAN and EU, we hope that it takes off uh, soon. Cooperation on connectivity front, cooperation with major stakeholders, uh, include the major regional and global parts. When we look at the challenges, there are so many challenges and likely pitfalls, uh, we discuss that at the fact end of my presentation. Now, why is connectivity important for Southeast Asia? When you talk about connectivity, we just focus on, it's like Belt and Road, which is Maritime Silk Road, 
the 10 Southeast Asian countries. We talk about Indo-Pacific connectivity. Uh, so when the idea was, uh, was raised in Southeast Asian countries, uh, that is ASEAN, when, when they said that, look, we are not comfortable with Indo-Pacific. India and Japan immediately started saying that, look, you are at the center. We are doing all this for you, right? So Southeast Asia there again. Um, if you look at other initiatives, PQI and a number of other initiatives, which Korea, India, Australia have taken, uh, even the European Union, Southeast Asia is at the center, except the Selkro economic belt, most of the focus is actually on Southeast Asia. Uh, there are reasons for that. Economic, you have a number of economic reasons. You have uh, the, uh, the idea is that Southeast Asia is at the, at the center of global trade routes, so Malacca Straits and Indian Ocean. Uh, you have the South China Sea dispute. I think at the heart of it is also the Sino use competition. So all, uh, all this is actually not devoid of political and strategic and balance of power politics, uh, which is my idea. So I had to uh, put that in. I think it has a lot to do with the balance of power politics. The way global uh, relations, the major power relations at the, at the international level are shaping up is actually uh, exciting number of countries and also they are, they are making them more interested in Belt and Road. It's not just about objections to the investment plans and rules and norms. It is also about uh, global balance of our politics. Now, Southeast Asia apparently is the only region for which you have all the major powers and the Asian powers having a dedicated policy. The Pivot to Asia, the Indo-Pacific, led by the US and its allies, has that good neighborly and peripheral diplomacy actually included Southeast Asia in that. The Belt and Road Initiative particularly the Maritime Silk Road, is about Southeast Asia. South Korea has the Southern policy, which is, again, Southeast Asia. New South Bond policy of uh, Taiwan. India's Look East and Act East policy engages Southeast Asia and keeps it at the center. The Partnership for Quality Investment, the Japanese idea. Of course, they focus more on bilateral uh, treaties and understandings than on multilateral. Then you have Russia, which has which has over the over past two decades has come up with the Asian vector, Eurasian strategy, multi-vector policy, and of course it is now manifested in the Eurasian Economic Union. Look at the FDI inflows in ASEAN. I think, uh, well, it, the most interesting part I'm sure everybody knows is that EU is the biggest investor in this uh, region, and yet does not have a dedicated Southeast Asia policy, right? A, a, a dedicated document as to how to deal with Southeast Asia on a number of aspects. Uh, but this gives you uh, other interesting, uh, uh, I would say, other interesting points. We'll discuss that maybe later. But all major parts are involved here. Their FDI investments are in Southeast Asian countries, which are tiny. Uh, which are which lack a sort of homogeneous structure. Half of them are not democracies. Half of them are actually fighting insurgency, separatism, Islamic fundamentalism. The world is not actually very happy with them, right? If you separate these countries as ten, you know, ten nations which are not part of ASEAN, nobody is going to go there. Nobody is going to invest in Southeast Asia. So, now coming to ASEAN connectivity. Connectivity for ASEAN refers to physical, institutional, people to people linkages that comprise the foundational support and facilitative means to achieve economic, political security, social cultural pillars towards realizing the vision of an integrated ASEAN country. Now, connectivity for ASEAN is different. It is not to, to become a, you know, a leader in a global uh, trade or attract more and more investment. Of course, that is, that is part of 
their strategy. But the end goal is achieving an integrated ASEAN community. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, Indo-Pacific strategy or Belt and Road doesn't talk about this. ASEAN talks about it. The key elements, most of them are usual, physical, transport, information, communications, technology, energy. Then you have institutional, which is trade liberalization and facilitation, investment and services liberalization and facilitation, mutual recognition agreements and arrangements. You have regional transport arrangements cross-border procedures and capacity building programs. And on P2P, you have tourism, education, and culture. Now, on the institutional front, ASEAN, along with its dialogue partners, is coming up with regional comprehensive economic partnership, which once it, of course, it includes China, but once realized that would be the biggest trade block, mega trade block. In the world. Connectivity means, for ASEAN, connectivity also means bringing in countries which are which are not very supportive of you which which are which have overshadowed your uh, presence which pose a long term threat to you but at the same time you engage in institutional soft balancing IR experts would say now for for ASEAN connectivity in southeast asia is indeed a vehicle for closer regional integration a single market and production base as a part of integrated ASEAN community by 2050 did not happen, uh, maybe in the next uh, five, ten years. The importance of being better connected to each other as well as domestically in order to link to the global supply chain. Uh, the key document for ASEAN is Master Plan on Connectivity. It was adopted in uh, 2010, 17,000 summit. Uh, there again, the main instrument, uh, the master plan on connectivity was, uh, it was seen as the main instrument in achieving regional economic integration. These are some other features of master plan on connectivity, on ASEAN connectivity. Uh, coming to the principles of SAMPAC, which is uh, master plan on ASEAN connectivity. It serves to accelerate, not hinder existing ASEAN initiatives, complement ASEAN community building procedures, win-win solution. This perhaps is the only region where you see win-win solution, right? Uh, China, of course, is the leading power, which we all the time uh, talks about win-win solution. God knows what they mean about it. We buy that. Strive for balance between regional and national interests. Strengthen connectivity between mainland and archipelago like Southeast Asia. This actually is, I would say, one of the biggest challenges before Southeast Asian countries. Uh, there still are differences uh, in terms of growth and development, connectivity, infrastructure between mainland Southeast Asia and maritime Southeast Asia. Outward looking and serve to promote healthy, competitive dynamic among external powers and help preserve ASEAN centrality. So for ASEAN, all this investment is fine. It doesn't matter how many billions and trillions of dollars you invest. You also have to look at the centrality of ASEAN, uh, which is under threat uh, because of the Belt and Road Initiative. So that is one point where ASEAN is still not sure, and ASEAN uh, countries are still thinking whether there should be a mechanism whereby China is invited and you discuss uh, things out and find a solution as to what the rules of the game should be. Thankfully, in case of the Indo-Pacific, things are changing and things are changing uh, pretty quickly. With the PQI, there is no, with the Japanese initiative, there is no such problem. So ASEAN, for ASEAN, centrality is important and the dialogue partners or the investors or major powers who have initiated these uh, Proposals have to work by Clear financial mobilization models, including involvement of private sector. Well, that is not, that is not happening in any of the major initiatives, except the Japanese. Uh, China is not looking at private sector. Uh, the Indo-Pacific, well, it is still at an essence stage. Uh, and there is a lot that has to be done, but still the private sector is not involved. All the money that has come up is actually the government money. Uh, 
these are details of the master plan on connectivity again. Uh, I skip that because uh, I'm running short of time. <coughs> the possible outcomes uh, for ASEAN connectivity are here. Now, when we talk about Belt and Road in China, Chinese initiatives, we tend to focus more on self road economic belt and the belt and self road and how that is going to alter the existing international system and rules based order. What we somehow tend to overlook is that China has got a major success in not just formulating but also establishing a multilateral body which is uh, the critiques have argued which is an alternative to the AAB. Now Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is, is one area, is one institution uh, where you, you see that a country like India, which is dead opposed to China on a number of things, for obvious reasons, uh, it's an existential threat, uh, the strategists will argue. Uh, but even there, India, China and Russia came together and established this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Why? Because one, China, India, Russia, most of Southeast Asian countries were not happy with the way Asian Development Bank and the World Bank operate. They feel that they are deprived of the gains that they should have had. Second, for Southeast Asian countries, which are, some of them are conflict ridden, uh, they don't actually meet the requirements uh, of, the, uh, of the Asian Development Bank in terms of funding. India is another example. In, the, in India, ADB would not invest in at least half a dozen states because it thinks that, the, that those states, those provinces of India are disputed territory because China claims those provinces are as its own. I mean, is that even <laughs> you know, logic? Just because the other country has claimed it, you're not going to invest in, uh, in those six provinces in India. So it is because of those reasons that India and Russia and China uh, worked on this idea and AIIB happened. That was a major boost to China-led regional mechanism. And this also has to be taken into account when we look at the Belt and Road, when we look at the Chinese uh, approach or the Chinese initiative of tweaking with the international uh, economic order, if not the international uh, strategic and formal order. However, in case of India, AIIB was an exception. After that, India has not supported any of the Chinese initiatives for uh, its own sovereignty and other reasons. I will not bore you with functions of AIIB. Um, these are the three top uh, stakeholders. Like I said before, it is proposed, it is projected as an alternative to the ADB and the World Bank. Uh, it has all major economies, barring Japan and the US. Uh, China, the driver's seat, Asian, a multilateral bank funding agency with an Asian face. Uh, more egalitarian is what they argue, uh, uh, what the propounders of this, of this institution argue. If you look at the projects also, the investments are mostly in Lao Pedia, in Indonesia. Uh, in Indonesia, there are projects which you would, like would be the last project that ADB would fund. And AIIB funded it because, uh, well, they wanted to do something new, of course. But also because these projects are really essential for the common people of these countries. Uh, in Philippines, uh, if you've been to Manila, the Metro Manila flood management project, you ask a local Filipino and he'll tell you how important that project is. Or the, uh, there's one project in Bangladesh. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, there are ele electricity projects in Bangladesh which are so important for the country that you really, I mean, you wonder why ADB and World Bank did not come to uh, to Bangladeshi authorities and uh, told them that look, we have to fund you because it's a question of well-being of your people. It's, it's uninterrupted power supply, at least 12 hours a day, is something that's basic, right? Nobody is asking for 24 hours of uh, electricity supply. So the situation is really uh, difficult in those 
uh, regions. If you look at Indo-Pacific connectivity, uh, there are more geostrategic uh, elements in it than, than economic. Uh, the idea is still evolving. Uh, you have to manage your funds and you have to also look at how, who's do, who should do what, and what Indo-Pacific connectivity actually means, because it's like, you know, 75% of the world. So what connectivity are we talking about? Are we looking at macro connectivity? Are we just looking at trade? Are we looking at something which goes beyond PPP? What connectivity are we talking about? And what are, who are the stakeholders? Who are the, who's the target beneficiary? So these are questions I think that Indo-Pacific, uh, the founders, uh, Canberra, Delhi, Tokyo, and Washington are grappling with. And it will take them some time to, to finally come up with a concrete document on this. Now, if you look at, can I, oh, okay. Very nice. Nice. All right. uh, well, I just want to tell you about how, what the national governments have, initiatives that national governments have taken. So in case of Thailand, there is Eastern Economic Corridor. Uh, for Malaysia, which is uh, much in news because of its, uh, because of Dr. Martha's opposition to Belgium Road. But there are a number of projects that Malaysia, uh, Malaysian government is working on. Uh, there again, there's, there's short of, shortage of funds. Uh, with Indonesia, there's Global Maritime Access, which sure you know about it. Uh, the Filipino idea of build, build, build program, which is doomed actually. Dudete is, uh, uh, is actually in a mess uh, when it comes to the promises that he, that he had made and the outcome. Uh, the strategic challenges to ASEAN connectivity are these. Summary. Alright, so when we look at connectivity from the Southeast Asian perspective, it is actually an insightful blend of rational policy and practice. You also have to look at the collective military strength of these countries, also their economic capabilities, and, and then sort of expect them to behave the way, uh, you know, respond to, to let's say, China's dashboard. ASEAN so far has welcomed the initiatives taken by all the major powers. This includes the US, this includes China and all the countries. The challenge there actually that ASEAN member countries are facing is bilateralism versus multilateralism. So in case of Belt and Road, it's mostly bilateral initiatives. That's what worries them. ASEAN, the, the member countries of, Southeast, uh, of ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries believe in clubbing their resources together and coming together as a unit and then working on this idea of institutional soft balancing, which is failing because most of the agreements that China's coming up, uh, China's proposing are actually uh, of bilateral nature. How peaceful would China's rise or development be is the question that I think everybody's asking and everybody's uh, confused. Uh, Mahathir, I, I, I think, has come up with some solutions some possible solutions uh, as to how to deal with Chinese aesthetic postures and also Belt and Road. How not to annoy China, but at the same time, keep your interests intact. The US-China relations, I think, is a key determinant for Southeast Asia in times to come. Uh, no country in Southeast Asia wants to choose one of these two. Uh, and the situation has changed so much that I'm afraid half of them would choose China, <laughs> which is really uh, not a good uh, situation. Uh, the relations among the Asian giants is also a, key, a, a very important factor, and there I'm talking about Japan, Korea, and Russia, how they deal with their, uh, their relationship, and what impact uh, uh, does that have on Southeast Asia. How uh, India and Japan work together and uh, work with ASEAN member countries on investment connectivity uh, and economic connectivity, of course, uh, the most important. So these are aspects that are very important, and we have to keep, it, uh, keep a tab on all of this uh, and see how things unfold. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Well, you said, um, rightly so, that uh, ASEAN is at the center of many things. It almost always insists on its centrality, whatever that means. Uh, well, that's very true. Uh, and this is very true in the field for a number of collectivity projects in the Mekong region. But in this case, you have a proliferation of initiatives. You have the greater Mekong sub-region, you have the Lankan Mekong region, you have the lower Mekong in initiative, whatever it's called. You have a number, you have ACMET. Yeah. Um, you have Mekong India Economic Corridor. Um, yes, on top of that. So you have so many of these initiatives which actually gather exactly the same member states. Well, sometimes there is one extra one. Uh, there's China sometimes, there's the US sometimes, but otherwise the five core member states are systematically there. And again, to be nasty, <laughs> I must admit I don't always see the differences between these various initiatives. So isn't there a risk of duplication? All these initiatives you know, do exactly the same thing. So what's the point of having three initiatives if the three initiatives have exactly the same objective? So uh, I guess there is perhaps a need for rationalization in this uh, region. Or perhaps I get that wrong and they are different and they have different objectives, in which case I'd be happy to, <laughs> to learn that. So well, that's the risk of uh, duplication and uh, as a result, you know, waste of resources. We, we kept insisting on the, the lack of resources. If uh, we had resources, which are actually uh, targeted to the same region through different ways, so I don't really see the point. Very good question. Let's collect another couple of questions, okay? okay? And then we can mark you also raise your hand. Yes. Thank you to both speakers. Um, <coughs> Talking about the centrality of ASEAN, it does remind me, though, that even though, as you correctly point out, ASEAN has been in the middle of many regional initiatives all around the Indo-Pacific, you still have a central problem, and ASEAN has been wrestling with this now for several decades, um, about the lack of a common foreign policy front on many of the issues that you bring forward. Uh, just over the past decade, you can see a lot of push and pull examples uh, from many of the great powers. First of all, you have the United States, the pivot or rebalancing policy that tended to uh, favor certain parts of Southeast Asia. Now we have the Belt and Road from the other side, and again, certain countries in ASEAN are being favored over others. And in some cases, such as Myanmar, you see quite a bit of very difficult balancing going on. So I was wondering if you can comment about how all of these external factors, as well as internal issues, may prevent you know, the kind of foreign policy coherency that ASEAN is looking for. Yeah, on uh, to Dr. Mishra, uh, you touched upon the cyber um, connectivity, the aspect. So we talked about non-physical um, connectivity. Um, would you say that is um, well feasible to reach an agreement on, for example, um, data sharing or intelligence sharing? Um, between the EU and ASEAN, um, even without, for example, a free trade agreement or even, well, disconnected from other agreements between those two regions? Very good, too. That's correct. You mentioned the digital connectivity. Very good. I like that topic. <laughs> <laughs> so I give you the floor first to Dr. Mita, as he was addressed, and then we go to Dr. Ismail as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right, so, well, the sub-regional initiative, especially in the Mekong sub-region, uh, I'm sure you know that the, uh, the GMS and the Mekong initiatives that are taken by Southeast Asian countries are actually a cross of uh, the uh, Lanchang Mekong Corporation. Because uh, Lanchang, of course, is not just led by China, it's actually controlled by China. So if you speak the other Mekong sub-region countries, uh, they're not very happy with it. And China is actually enforcing, uh, trying to make Lan Chang Mekong Corporation as the leading sub-regional groupings. So there, I think, uh, it's mostly because the other external players play a uh, very important role in, in case of both uh, India and China. I think that is a, a factor that you have to uh, keep in mind. 
Mekong countries are as it is, they are not industrially, they are not very really advanced. Um, so, and they have uh, the shortfall that they have in terms of infrastructure, uh, development gaps that they have are huge. So they have to be dependent on countries like China and there's no way out. Now, the only uh, way to deal with such a situation is uh, what you have always collectively, the stand united. Uh, but I don't see that happening in the consolidation. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. Uh, to Mark's question, I think uh, the external players have always played a role. I mean, you go back to 1967. It was not ASEAN's own initiative. It was not the initiative that these five member countries were taking. Before that, they had ASA and Mokalando. They were looking at, you know, the idea of Malay uh, grouping, right? So even the formation of ASEAN was shaped, influenced by an external actor, and that was the US. Back in 1967, China was an existential threat. So you, uh, you got together and you established this little club because you had the apprehension that Indonesia episode might just, Indonesia is actually about, just about to start. So similar things could happen to other countries also. So if you ask me as to how, whether the situation in 1967 was worse or 2018, 2019 is worse, I would still say 67 was much worse. Uh, and at the same time, the Southeast Asian countries did not support CETO. In CETO, you were just to uh, the Philippines and Thailand, which supported uh, the American initiative. So right from the beginning, uh, these small Southeast Asian countries understand what their identity is about. And their statecraft, their foreign policy is shaped by that. They support external players, <coughs> major powers, to the extent that it suits their interests. And I think there is no other uh, phrase which explains this, uh, this aptly, which is uh, the soft institutional soft balancing. And you can try and uh, uh, use bits of constructivism here and there, but, but they don't set the norms. ASEAN countries do not set the norms. It's, it's by bringing in other important external players that they try and stabilize the, uh, maintain the equilibrium. So whether it is the, the American or the Chinese, the end result is bring more and more countries into the system. So that's why I think uh, for the European Union, unfortunately I didn't have time to explain why European Union is important. And more important than any other country, any other uh, stakeholder. Uh, because EU, if uh, European Union is serious about it, would bring in rules-based system on economic, trade, investment issues, on infrastructure. Other parts are talking about, Japan is characteristically very quiet about what it does in Southeast Asia. But other countries are not even looking at it. So European Union could actually offer an alternative to the Belgian road. And, and by throwing the hat in the ring, I think what it would do is make China behave. Right. So the moment you get a sort of competition, which is, which is not on strategic military terms, uh, I would say that the situation would, would improve. So, uh, External and internal factors that influence Southeast Asia will always there, will always be there. Um, it depends on what you expect from these countries. Uh, so, yeah, that's all I can say. And what are the third questions? The intelligence, <laughs> yes. intelligence sharing and data sharing. I think Southeast Asia is doing pretty well. Uh, sitting in, in Kuala Lumpur, I thought that we are on the verge of a you know, small skirmish with Singapore. Uh, for obviously things, water sharing and, and number of things, airplane flying. Uh, and still there is a, a great deal of cooperation on intelligence sharing. Uh, for example, on counterterrorism operations. Uh, 
I think on data sharing also, ASEAN is doing pretty well. And there is an established mechanism with the European Union. Is the point really is how do you, how do you make it more comprehensive? How do you uh, move it to the next level? And there, I think more structured dialogue uh, is a possibility. Of course, the European Union being a dialogue partner uh, engages ASEAN uh, in these annual meetings, uh, and you have a number of them, like thousands of meetings uh, in a year. Um, but still, I think a, a more structured cooperation, which which looks at uh, soft connectivity, connectivity that is uh, related to trade issues and, and digital uh, domains and data sharing, et cetera, uh, would be a great uh, idea. Break it down. Let's move now. Finally, it's the first night. Well, I don't think there are uh, specific questions addressed to me, but uh, well, you perhaps, yeah, yeah, perhaps I could uh, uh, try to answer uh, two uh, questions here. Yeah. First, uh, question from Professor Nicholas. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, there is a lot of initiative ASEAN has launched uh, so far, especially also in the Mekong area. Uh, that is true. Uh, that's actually the, the challenge that uh, ASEAN should answer in the, in the future. Uh, if uh, ASEAN would uh, uh, see the relevancy of its existence uh, for their people. And I think uh, Dr. Uh, Ramos was uh, right that uh, talking about the uh, Mekong project, uh, it's so far has been uh, a control of, uh, of uh, China itself. ASEAN is not much uh, engaged in, uh, in this uh, uh, Mekong uh, project. But yeah, it's sad that because uh, there are a lot of problems in the uh, uh, related to Mekong project, uh, not only a social economic, uh, local, local social economy that has not been uh, uh, fully uh, developed, but also the problem of environmental degradation is uh, very secure. Uh, so um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, that's why I, 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 I asked the, the question, what's a uh, key stakeholder that can ASEAN uh, engage in the future to uh, so a lot of initiatives that they have uh, officially designed uh, in so uh, comprehensive way can be well implemented uh, business sectors NGOs and other but I think uh, I, I agree with uh, some quotes that uh, cities uh, local governments in ASEAN should uh, should really be in, uh, into taken into account uh, how they can be empowered so that uh, uh, many projects that ASEAN has been uh, launched so far uh, really, really uh, effectively well implemented and achieved uh, the, the, the targets. Uh, that's maybe uh, my uh, my comments on the Professor Nicholas' question. And then talking about uh, the questions, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> from uh, the second uh, uh, about uh, ASEAN lack of common foreign policy. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is another <laughs> uh, important critics on uh, on ASEAN in uh, many uh, quite many issues that in which ASEAN has been a challenge uh, about their uh, their solid uh, position on on several uh, issues, not only in the political issues but also in the in, uh, environmental, diplomatic, uh, in international negotiations, uh, such as in. Uh, climate change and uh, yeah, uh, like the Paris Agreement, it's very fair to, to hear that ASEAN has the same position in, towards that uh, critical issue on uh, global uh, climate change. Uh, what, what the factors that have uh, influenced for this, uh, uh, these limitations or weaknesses of ASEAN? Uh, according to me, according to me uh, internal factors can be, uh, can be uh, mentioned uh, among others are about the, you know, uh, the principle of ASEAN to respect uh, the position of uh, national interest. And also, uh, you know, especially in Asia, that has been uh, playing for, as a natural leader for, for uh, over the time uh, since uh, ASEAN it, uh, has been established in 1967. Uh, Indonesia tends to be uh, more, more, uh, and more uh, 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 
be, be, be careful in, in you know, how to apply the principles of ASEAN, but at the same time also uh, uh, have to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, have to uh, have to maintain the 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 the, the main objectives of the ASEAN in terms of uh, stability and uh, you know uh, not uh, getting involved in the open conflict. Uh, besides, uh, also I think uh, bilateral connections between uh, ASEAN uh, individual countries with their uh, partners also have uh, can be uh, taken into account as. Uh, Another uh, factor, and also content depends on the the, the issue themselves. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, this is quite right that uh, to some extent ASEAN is lack of common foreign policy, but uh, so far ASEAN still uh, solid in terms of you know as the regional organizations. They have done so much, uh, but of course because of the external challenges has so dynamic and uh, you know uh, uh, very complex so uh, they have to uh, that's the way of uh, that's uh, ASEAN way of how to uh, to manage the issues they have to face uh, with their external actors and uh, their national interests should be balanced in, in that uh, to uh, to uh, contract with the uh, area. Uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe that's all for <laughs> the time If you are not uh, satisfied with it, uh, we can uh, talk later. Maybe you have time enough later uh, on to okay. discuss more. So, last question maybe, and we we'll move to the first panel. Uh, uh, a question is to the uh, If you just talk about uh, that uh, uh, ASEAN uh, welcome uh, early initi initiatives uh, launched by measure. Uh, countries uh, is a world. So it uh, reminded me of uh, one of uh, ASEAN models uh, is uh, uh, ASEAN always insists uh, the, uh, the, uh, the norms of uh, neutrality. Mm. Uh, because I think uh, 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 many regions began to uh, practice the process of regionalization. Uh, uh, but if uh, 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 some countries unite uh, as a region and uh, then take an exclu exclusive policy to other regions, then it will be a lot useful for the regional peace. Uh, so I, I want to know, uh, do you think uh, the neutrality norms uh, is uh, useful or has some implications for other regions' regionalization? I think ASEAN still sticks to this idea of neutrality and I have one incident in mind. The current Vietnamese ambassador to India uh, happens to be a hawk, so from the from the Mopa. So when he joined the uh, the embassy in Delhi, he was asked by one of the journalists whether Vietnam supports Indo-Pacific and the Quad. Uh, well, the ambassador stopped him at the first question, the first part of the question, and he said, "We." support Indo-Pacific if there is no military angle to it. So please don't ask me whether we support Quad or not. And that's Vietnam, which has been facing military strategic challenges from, uh, from China, which has involved in arts uh, skirmishes with China, and yet it does not support something which is more, of, which has more military uh, dimensions to it. So I think that neutrality, nobody uses that term anymore. Uh, it has become a little obsolete in terms of nomenclature. But yes, Southeast Asia, the ASEAN number countries still follow that. And that is why they are not opposing Belt and Road. They're only talking about the rules. That they're, they're not even talking about rules. They're talking about transparency, right? So what Mahathir is actually doing it's not neutrality, but he's saying, give me a fair deal. You want to invest in my country, I, I want to borrow money from you. So there has to be some standard procedure, right? So SOP is something, standard operating procedure is something that he's looking for. And it is important here. 
uh, somebody in the in the first session had said that in the uh, first half had said that the European Union could offer uh, Malaysia an alternative. I don't think even if the European Union does that, I don't think Mahathir would accept that. He has made a very careful, calculated decision that by saying no to China, he does not mean yes to Japan or the US or any other country. It's a problem that has to be resolved with China. And there, there are no replacements. Right? So that gives you a, a beautiful flavor of what neutrality in its modern sense is uh, in Southeast Asia. And one of the strongest uh, leaders of Malaysia, perhaps the strongest, uh, uh, from one of the strongest countries in Southeast Asia is saying that. So it really means uh, quite a lot. Thailand is another example. Thailand, uh, because of what is happening in the country on the democratic front, uh, the, the US Thailand joint exercises, the Cobra World exercise, all of them were put on hold. And it was not the Americans, but the Thais who had said that we don't want any exercise of the view. But now they've they opened up to both, to both China and to, uh, to the US. So they will propose. It has to be, uh, first, it, it should not be uh, against anybody's interest, any other major power's interest, and second, it has to be the benefit of, or the benefit of our central community as a whole. So, yes, neutrality is very much uh, in practice. Very good. We are going to leave it here because otherwise we jump into the other panel and we don't have time. But beforehand, thank you very much.